Hello, everyone. Welcome to the September 2024 presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I'm Ben Woodbury with the Friends of History and will serve as your host today. These monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with support from the New Mexico History Museum and from donations from our audience. Today, we are happy to welcome Bob Roseborough. Bob is a lawyer, outdoorsman, and author or co-author of four previous books. Of note, Tony Hillerman included Bob as a character by his real name in Tony's best-selling novel, The Fallen Man. Bob was born on his grandfather's ranch near Jal, grew up in Farmington, attended college and law school in Albuquerque, and moved to Gallup in 1979, where he was elected mayor in 2003. Today, Bob will introduce us to the history of and his experiences in Gallup, New Mexico. Gallup is a place that is disproportionately and simultaneously wonderful and terrible. A reservation border town with a remarkably diverse citizenry, Gallup started out as a railroading and coal mining town with an alcohol-soaked violent history. As an outsider who embraced the realities of this enigmatic place, Bob came to know many of Gallup's larger-than-life figures personally and became fascinated with Gallup's history. Today's talk is drawn from Bob's recent book, a, a Place of Thin Veil, which received the Historical Society of New Mexico's Gaspar Perez de Villagra Award in 2023. This book gives, a, gives readers a rare and true insight into Gallup, its iconic stories and its long kept secrets. So Bob, welcome. We look forward to hearing your reflections on living in Gallup. Well, uh... I appreciate the invitation to, to participate in this lecture and um, really um, I, I always like the opportunity to talk about Gallup. Um, it's a very unique and, and, and from my perspective, wonderful place. Well, you know, so having provided some slide photos, I'd like to kind of leap into that. Um, and uh, the first slide photo is a, an aerial photo of the Nutria monocline. Um, which is also known locally here in Gallup as the hogback. Um, and this is a, a remarkable geographic feature. And it um, makes, in some respects, makes Gallup what it is. Um, it, uh, there is a gap in the monocline through which the railroad, um, uh, Route 66, and now I-40 flow. And as a result, uh, the monocline or the location of the monocline has kind of also uh, thus defined uh, the location of Gala. <clears throat> I've also uh, uh, provided some uh, slides of uh, Navajo people. Um, and these are historic slides um, uh, by a photographer by the name of Malarkey. Um, who was kind of in Gallup back in the old days and really uh, took some remarkable photographs of Navajo people kind of depicting uh, their state of life um, at, yeah, in Gallup or in, in and around Gallup. Uh, the first photo is a photo of a Navajo family. Uh, um, a, uh, then a photo of an old Hogan, old style Hogan, uh, with a Navajo woman nearby. Uh, in another photo, the next photo would be uh, a photo of uh, Navajo grandmas uh, doing what's called a sheep dip, which is they're running uh, their sheep uh, through uh, some dipping stations. Uh, to protect against infestation of uh, through insects. And uh, uh, then there's a, a wonderful photo of uh, Navajo, uh, Navajo men racing on horseback, uh, kind of against a, a, 
a gathering storm. Uh, that's one of my favorites. Um, and in contrasting that, uh, uh, there's a photo of the uh, the Anglo-dominated uh, board of directors of the Gallup Indian ceremonial uh, back in that time frame, showing the real, um, for lack of a better word, well, difference, difference, kind of stark difference between the two cultures, between the uh, Navajo people close to the earth and to the animals and to the uh, uh, businessmen, uh, Gallup businessmen who are operating the intertribal Indian ceremonial for profit. After the photos of the uh, early photos of the Navajo, um, Navajo people kind of like to change directions and, and talk about uh, coal mining and not just coal mining, but underground coal mining and how that affected um, the growth of Gallup. And, but, for the, but for the existence of coal uh, in and about Gallup, Gallup um, would not have existed. Um, it was a born in uh, 1880 with the passage of the railroad. Um, it was uh, a place um, that was productive for coal mining. And, but for the existence of the coal, uh, probably would not have um, there probably would not have been Gallup, but we have uh, a couple of photos of underground coal miners just kind of showing the, um, what it's like to be underground in the coal mine. Uh, the seams, the coal mine seams, uh, were generally between three and seven feet. Um, uh, and um, then we have yet another photo of coal miners, and these are Japanese coal miners who are around an entrance to a coal mine. And that gives you a hint to the, uh, a little bit of a hint to the ethnic um, uh, diversity of the men uh, who toiled in, in the Gallup coal mines. Uh, the coal mines started, uh, initially with um, Englishmen and Irishmen, uh, Celts, um, and uh, then uh, quickly grew to uh, uh, Southern Europeans, um, uh, Italians, a lot of Italians moved to Gallup, um, and, then, um, and then some of the Serbian people as well. Um, and then, um, Eventually, um, about in, uh, in the 1970s, again, the coal mining started roughly in the 1880s, but by the uh, early 1900s, and, and particularly in the era of uh, 1917, when Pancho Villa was running wild uh, in northern Mexico, uh, many um, uh, Mexican men and Mexican families moved to Gallup. Uh, to become coal miners. Um, and there, uh, we have uh, a family of the Esparza family, uh, it's, uh, who were, whose family were coal miners, and it's showing uh, the fought Mr. Esparza and his wife and four of their 14 children who moved uh, to Gallup. And many of, many of uh, the descendants of the Esparza family uh, along with other Hispanic uh, families that uh, continue to live in Gallup today, of course. Um, shifting from uh, coal mining, well, actually not. It's, uh, this is a, a, a different topic, but di directly related to coal mining. And it's kind of, um, kind of the end of the era, era in terms of uh, coal mining. And that is the uh, riot uh, in which a, a sheriff died of gunshot wounds in a, an alley that is essentially a block and a half from where I'm doing this recording uh, in Gallup. And, um, and uh, it was a rem truly remarkable uh, historic event. 
uh, the uh, a deputy sheriff uh, was gunned down and shot to death in this alley. Um, and uh, the circumstances of how that occurred are uh, to this date uh, somewhat uh, disputed by some. And um, but the there was a trial. Um, and the trial, uh, basically, uh, when the sheriff died in the alley, uh, uh, virtually all of the uh, Mexican coal miners uh, in Gallup were rounded up and, uh, and put on trial. Uh, the, I'm good, the short version um, is um, that the coal miners, the Hispanic coal miners did not shoot the sheriff or the sheriff's deputy. Um, the sheriff's deputy was uh, shot. Uh, it was later discovered, um, many, many years later, uh, discovered it, uh, the sheriff's deputy was actually shot by another deputy. We have, uh, you know, a, a series of photos here. Uh, one of the photos is uh, the uh, imposition of uh, martial law uh, in Gallup, uh, followed by um, a photo of uh, Victor Campos, who was uh, one of the leading coal mine members who had been evicted from his home and, uh, and was the defendant in a trial uh, that was taking place in the magistrate court, uh, which backed up to the alley. Um, also, uh, um, the photos are of David Levinson, uh, who was an attorney prior to the trial, uh, who represented uh, uh, the workers' unions and was uh, reputedly a, uh, an attorney with communist affiliations who came to Gallup uh, prior to the trial of Gallup 14, uh, was uh, um, by his version, there are two different versions, but by his version, um, he uh, was abducted uh, by ruffians who took him, took him out onto the reservation north of Gallup, uh, beat him up, uh, and then left him to stagger back into town. Um, another photo that follows of this era is of Martha Roberts. Uh, she was a labor organizer and a real firebrand. Um, she um, is shown in the photo speaking to a, a group, large group of coal miners uh, passionately, and that was her reputation. She was uh, passionate by nature and committed to her cause of uh, trying to gain uh, good conditions and wages uh, for uh, the coal miners of that era. Um, a photo that gives me goosebumps when I see it is a photo of the coal miners, the um, Hispanic coal miners in Kitchen's Opera House, um, standing with fist rays, um, uh, 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 <clears throat> And it's, uh, it shows just the air of uh, differences uh, between, and, and in some respects, the desperation of the coal miners of that time. Um, the next photo is a photo um, of, uh, from the Denver Post um, uh, of, of photos taken um, for, uh, you know, the deputies in the riot um, or, or the uh, photos from the riot. And, and, uh, and then in uh, yet another photo uh, is, a, is a group of citizen uh, um, deputies. Uh, following the riot in which the sheriff's deputy uh, died, um, immediately, uh, um, law enforcement officers and the ju judicial system in Gallup um, basically uh, deputized approximately 200 to 250 citizens uh, in, uh, with guns uh, to patrol the streets of Gallup to avoid another confrontation. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, 
there is a photo of one of the deputies who survived, uh, a deputy named Bobcat Wilson. And uh, Bobcat uh, uh, Wilson's gun was the gun um, that was discharged um, uh, in the alley, uh, resulting in the death um, uh, of the deputy. <clears throat> to make a long story, well, I'm going to let you read the book to find out who, who really uh, shot the sheriff. So we'll, um, we'll move on to another topic. And that topic is of, um, a topic closer in age, but, of, uh, but yet again um, of a stark um, contrast between the haves and the haves nots. And this is a story of uh, Larry Casutes. Um, who is a Navajo man um, who was my age. Um, I'm now 70, um, and I graduated high school in 1971 from Farmington High, and Larry Casus graduated from Gallup High in 1971. And uh, although we uh, never met, um, we both went to the University of New Mexico. Um, and when we were sophomores, uh, I was uh, driving back to my dorm uh, one day in a little pont red Pontiac that I had. And as I was pulling up to Alvarado dorm at the University of New Mexico, uh, there was a radio broadcast uh, announcing uh, that the mayor of Gala a gentleman named Emmett Garcia, who I would meet later in late, many, many years later. Uh, but there was a radio bulletin announcing um, that um, uh, Emmett Garcia uh, had been shot and killed uh, on uh, Route 66 in Gala, and uh, that his uh, abductor that there was an abductor and that he and that uh, Mayor Garcia uh, had been abducted. Um, and uh, let's let's look at some of the slides on this. We have a slide um, in which um, Lyric Jesus um, and uh, his fellow uh, uh, native students at the University of New Mexico uh, we're burning a, an effigy of Emmett Garcia um, be, at a meeting of the UNM Board of Regents. And this is before the abduction. Um, we have then a slide um, of the mayor's desk. Uh, and that uh, desk is uh, in the same office where I was later, ma later mayor. Um, that, but that's the uh, desk um uh, with bullet holes in it um, showing the struggle um a struggle um or the remains of the struggle um, between larry casus and emmett garcia in that office um, and what happened is is that uh um and first to give a little bit of background i guess which would be helpful here is uh, you know why was larry casus um so passionate and upset and and uh, why was he taking actions uh, violent actions of this nature he had uh <clears throat> the Ricasus had been pro protesting to the unm board of regents and the unm board of regents had had uh, had simply rejected uh his protest he was pressed protesting uh, the confirmation of Mayor Garcia as a uh, regent to the University of New Mexico. Uh, Mayor Garcia at the time uh, was a co-owner of a problem bar uh, that bordered the Navajo Nation. And it was a problem bar that had um, an unfortunate history. It was a problem bar where Navajo uh, people where people driving by the bar uh, could see uh, on occasion and um, and on many occasions, sometimes during the winter, that uh, Navajo men had frozen to death over the course of the night 
um, you know, after purchasing alcohol at the bar uh, and then uh, would die in the cold winter nights uh, of the reservation. Um, uh, or alternatively, uh, during the warmer months, uh, the, the passersby would see uh, Navajo men who were passed out face down on ant piles. So it was uh, something that was, uh, just to put it mildly, divisive. Um, and it was something that a young man, Larry Casus, uh, felt uh, deeply uh, passionate about and had, was protesting about and was um, being uh, repeatedly disregarded by both the regents and the New Mexico state legislators um, uh, as, he, as he fought the confirmation of uh, the Gallup mayor Emmett uh, Garcia to be a UNM agent. Um, we have, uh, um, you know, photos of uh, uh, the interior uh, after the, we have the, the interior of Stern Sporting Goods. And Stern Sporting Goods is the um, sporting goods star down on Highway 66 in Gallup in which Larry uh, Larry Casus took him at Garcia down at gunpoint. Um, at one point, uh, Larry Casus heard a noise uh, back in the alley, uh, in the, which would be in the back of the store. Uh, he directed um, uh, a kind of a, a co-conspirator of his, uh, Robert Nakai Dene, uh, to go to the back of the store uh, to see what was what was going on there. He kept. Uh, continued to keep uh, his gun on uh, on uh, Mayor Mayor Garcia. Uh, Mayor Garcia used kind of the diversion of the of the need for Nakai Dene to go back to the back as an opportunity uh, uh, to strike, and uh, Mayor Garcia uh, kicked the gun out of uh, Robert Nakai Dene's hands. Um, and I and I have that reversed. It was Larry Casus who was uh, going to the back, and Robert Nakai Dene was was holding the mayor at gunpoint. Then we have uh, uh, photos of of the uh, of the glass in the Stearns Sporting Goods store, uh, depicting uh, the amount of gunfire that took place. Uh, the next photo is of. Uh, um, Larry Casus's corpse uh, on the sidewalk uh, uh, with Larry's body, bloody body being blocked out uh, uh, from the photo. Uh, and then we have a photo of uh, uh, Emmett Garcia, uh, the Gallup mayor in the hospital following uh, the shootout. And, um, and then there's, uh, the next photo is uh, a photo of protest marches in the streets of Gallup by Navajo people following the death of Larry Casus. Uh, the Navajo people uh, protesting uh, the fact that um, uh, Larry, Larry Casus was, was shot to death by the Gallup police officers. Um, and uh, the final photo in this group of photos is um, Emmett Garcia and Gallup Police Chief Manuel Gonzalez, uh, many, many years later, uh, uh, giving a talk at the University of New Mexico at Gallup, and uh, in which uh, they uh, particularly, um, Sheriff Garcia, um, to his credit, uh, gave some very specific comments um, about what happened uh, and in terms of the fuselage um, resulting in, in the death of uh, Larry Casus. And I'll, um, that's the other uh, thing that I'm gonna, uh, I think deserves to be left uh, uh, to be read you know, rather than me. Uh, uh, share with you today.
So from that uh, very painful, uh, difficult segment of Gallup's history, I'd like to shift to something a little bit more uplifting, and that is um, the walk to Santa Fe. Um, uh, Eddie Munoz um, became, uh, was a historic figure in Gallup. Um, mayor Munoz um, was elected mayor for uh, uh, a few terms when he was a young man. And then late in life, I believe when he was, I believe he was 75, he ran for mayor again. And he ran um, on a ticket of uh, doing something about alcohol or Gallup's alcohol problem. And with the, in partnership with the uh, Art Rehoboth McKinley Christian Hospital here in Gallup, um, Mayor uh, Munoz um, uh, partnered with the hospital personnel and decided to uh, walk to Santa Fe. Uh, during the legislative session, demand the uh, legislative changes uh, that would uh, address some of Gallup's alcohol problems, including the request for a treatment uh, facility. Um, we have a photo of the uh, walk to Santa Fe, and then a photo of uh, a rally uh, taken on the Capitol steps. Um, one of the uh, participants at the rally uh, told me once, um, looking at her photo, um, uh, while she was on the steps, she said, um, she said, I felt like um, at that moment um, that I was, uh, you know, the struggles of my life were over and that I was um, ready to I, I was so moved by the march and by the legislative changes um, that I, it, that if I were to die, I was ready to die. I would die happy. Um, if, uh, another photo is of um, uh, two mothers. Um, uh, one is uh, uh, the walk to Santa Fe, Santa Fe had been uh, titled uh, as a journey for Jovita, uh, which was a young uh, Navajo baby uh, that had died in uh, a collision with a drunk driver. Uh, the Anglo woman in the photo is the wife of the drunk driver. The other woman is the um, uh, mother uh, uh, of the infant who um, who died. Let's switch to uh, again an, another more um, a softer topic, and that's our uh, uh, Navajo coat talkers. Um, we have uh, a series of three photos of coat talkers in the field in the uh, Pacific Theater in World War II. Um, after those uh, three photos, uh, we have a, a photo of uh, Wilfred Billy, who was a code talker. And then uh, the Navajo code talkers late in life in, uh, in a parade. Um, and what I would say of the Navajo code talkers is, um, uh, you know, there it's uh, when you live in Gallup, it, it's um, you cannot understate um, the uh, pride and the um, respect that the Navajo people have for the Navajo Cotacos. Um These were young men. Uh, whose ancestors had been um, marched from their homeland uh, to Bosque Redondo in eastern New Mexico uh, and returned uh, many, after uh, much of, of the Navajo uh, 
the Navajo people had died uh, <clears throat> at Bosque Redondo. Some had escaped uh, and and had uh, avoided um, to at their peril going to Bosque Redondo. Um, but these um, uh, then uh, decades later in World War II, uh, these young Navajo men um, developed a code uh, that saved um, uh, American, uh, many American lives in that in that Pacific theater, um, and they. Uh, um, it's something that uh, the Navajo people, um, as I say, take great, understandably take great pride in. Um, and that's, uh, I guess, a, uh, you know, there's, there's many more aspects to, to Gallup. Um, it's, uh, um, as been said initially, um, Gallup is, is a, a place that really is uh, simultaneously and disproportionately wonderful and terrible. Uh, we focused, we focused, you know, a lot of these photos um, describe the more the difficult side of it. Uh, I can tell you there, um, there, there truly is a wonderful side uh, to this community too. Uh, the uh, racial diversity of it um, is. Uh, is beautiful, um, it, and it, that's not to say that it's not without conflict. Um, and uh, there, there is always where there is diversity. There is always going to be some conflict, um, but um, it, it's a place where um, uh, I feel uh, blessed to have uh, lived. Uh, you know, for, for several decades. And it's frankly a, a place that I feel blessed to have uh, raised children. Um, I think it's uh, um, it was a, a wonderful uh, experience for my children uh, to grow up in Gallup. So um, I think that um, Ben may have some more questions for me. And, and Ben, um, having run through the photos, I'd be glad to kind of have a, have a dialogue with you about um, any any questions that you might think our audience would uh, would benefit from us talking about? Thank you, Bob, for sharing these painful as well as uplifting events in Gallup's checkered history. We appreciate your commitment to Gallup and the challenge it must have been for you to write about the successes and failed opportunities of your, your adopted home with its notable multi-ethnic character. I particularly appreciated the selection of photos you have shared with us as part of your talk. Gallup's history is an important one and your thoughts are an important contribution to the understanding of this community. I do have a few questions. I'd like to start by asking you if you might talk a bit about the title of your book in which you call Gallup a place of thin veil. Okay. Um... Yeah, that's, um, I'd be glad to, Ben. Um, uh, late in my term as mayor, um, I was at a Mexican restaurant in Chihuahua, which is the neighborhood um, where the coal miners uh, from the Gal 14 live. And um, I was having lunch with a Presbyterian minister who I, had become a friend of mine. He, uh, his name was Don Steele. And he had uh, moved to Gallup very late in life. He was, I believe that he was in his late seventies and perhaps even 80. And um, we, as we were sitting in uh, El Matate restaurant, looking out onto Chihuahua, um, a, a thought just ran through my mind, which was to say, um, uh, Don, why are you here? <laughs> why, why did you move to Gallup? And uh, and to my surprise, he he had an answer. He, he had a quick answer, which surprised me. And the, and the answer itself was 
something I had never considered before, but he basically said, uh, he said, well, Bob, I'm Irish. Um, and as Irishmen, or as an Irishman, you know, we have this concept, which is uh, a concept of a place of thin veil. And it's uh, that there are certain areas in the world uh, where the um, uh, veil um, between the, the sacred and um, and um, and just the common world is thinner and more permeable, and that it's more uh, there's more of an ability to have access to uh, spirit, um, you know, in places of thin veil, and that is uh, something that really hit home with me, and or actually, the better way to characterize it is something that rang true with me. Um, and uh, and just to be interested, I mean, uh, you know, I've had the, I've had this conversation, this exact conversation, these exact words, you know, probably um, with with people, um, you know, Gallup residents and people, you know, coming into Gallup to experience who who asked me about it, um, probably about 200, 250 times over the course of the last ten or fifteen years. And what's interesting is um, I have not one of them ever has said, oh, that's a bunch of baloney, or how could you uh, think or feel that? Uh, mo most of the people who experience Gallup uh, seem to um, uh, kind of resonate um, with, that, with that thought and with that, uh, the the, that kind of nature to this community. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we uh, one of the topics you you don't touch on is your time as 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 mayor. Clearly, you are very fond of uh, Gallup and uh, its people, and uh, have a strong commitment to to see it improve. What do you consider were your most was your most successful contribution as mayor or or at any time throughout your career? Uh, in improving, in, in, in working to improve the quality of life at Gallup. Okay. Um, yeah, my four years as mayor I were just absolutely the best times of my life and the, and the worst times of my life. Um, I was fortunate early on to, um, I won, I really campaigned hard um, and worked hard in my campaign and uh, won a decisive victory. It was a it was a landslide of sorts, and so I had going into the mayorship. I had um, a lot of capital, political capital. Um, the uh, um, Gallup had a lot of needs, needless to say, um, and um, you know one of them was water. Um, one of the pri my priorities as mayor was uh, working. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, to uh, assure the Navajo Gallup water supply project. Um, and that was somewhat controversial and that the biggest opponents of it were, were in Farmington, which is the town that I grew up. Uh, and on one occasion, I had to basically go up to Farmington uh, as mayor of Gallup and battle a Farmington city councilor uh, over whether uh, the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project, which supplies the water future both for the Navajo Nation and for Gallup, was a good thing or not. Um, we had uh, uh, severe uh, infrastructure uh, problems uh, and deficits uh, when I took over the mayorship. Um, and um, one of the things uh, that um, I did right as mayor um, was we um, we sought a, a, an outside professional uh, city manager, um, and uh, we really got lucky. We got a, a gentleman named uh, Eric Honeyfield, who had been city manager in Fortone and has been city manager in other places in New Mexico and in Texas. I believe Eric lives in Las Cruces now, uh, and he was an engineer by education and early training. 
and he was incredibly um, uh, helpful in terms of uh, assessing our and ranking our infrastructure needs and looking for funding sources in which we could address our infrastructure need. Uh, we needed um, affordable housing and we started uh, affordable housing projects. Um, I've got a kind of a list, um, kind of a, a brochure of some of the things we did. We started um, some quality of life initiatives. Um, we um, <clears throat> uh built a swimming pool an aquatic center um and uh um and we also started you know doing some outdoor recreation i'm a real uh proponent of outdoor recreation and i i, I love the outdoors myself uh we started a, a you know a shooting range uh, uh an archery range um uh, we, believe it or not, we uh, 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 bought, bought a cliff um, out west of town in which we as it was a climbing area. And we started uh, what's now the High Desert Trail, which was uh, 24, uh, a 24 mile loop system of walking and biking paths. Um, the uh, other things we did. Um, our uh, Red Rock State Park outside of, uh, you know, to the east of Gallup uh, needed a great deal of uh, work and we, we uh, put some money into that. Uh, we started uh, trying to draw events uh, to Gallup, uh, such as a um, dawn till dusk, a 24 hour race, biking, mountain biking race. Um, we saw the Wrangler, Wrangler Junior High Rodeo uh, came to Gallup. Um, and then we started um, some downtown uh, festivals uh, to draw people into the downtown area. Um, we our, our downtown needed a big uplift uh, and it also needed to be protected. We needed to do a flood, a, uh, um, flood protection uh, dam uh, or a, a uh, second street dam was constructed for flood control of the downtown area. Uh, we did uh, eight historic murals. Uh, we did some uh, treescape uh, trees. Uh, we did a renovation of the historic Elmore Theater um, and started a uh, Code Parker Museum uh, there as well. Um, uh, I, the other thing, we did a, a kind of a variety of beautification projects, um, did some tree plantings, uh, enacted a, a glass bottle uh, ordinance, um, at, uh, in, incentivizing people to, um, and, and paying people uh, to bring in glass bottles um, as opposed to breaking them out in the hinterlands. Um, and we also uh, purchased a group of graffiti removal um, machine and established a graffiti hotline to kind of keep keep track of the gra graffiti removal. So we were um, uh, one of the other things that we did, which was a little bit unusual, is is that we um, I you know really spent some time talking to our professional staff at the city, trying to determine whether we were. Um, had too many employees or not enough employees. And um, what I came away with uh, from those discussions is, is that we had too many uh, employees, um, but we were not paying them well. And uh, what we st started doing uh, is we, we didn't fire anyone, but through attrition, uh, we started when people uh, passed away or uh, retired or moved out of town, uh, we uh, uh, withheld replacing some of those positions and shifted some positions around uh, to generate more money to pay uh, empl employees more, but had uh, ultimately fewer employees, which is um, was surprisingly not controversial. I thought there would be controversy associated with that, but it turned out that it wasn't. Um, and uh, we also um, 
did a lot of uh, uh, condemnations uh, of, uh, of nuisance properties and uh, actively pursued some urban renewal funds uh, for um, for updating and, and improving some of the, the properties that do exist in Gallup. So that's, um, there's more, but that's, I said more than enough, so. Yeah. Indeed, there, it, it's quite a positive list and uh, certainly, uh, you know, has led to, to, to improvements throughout Gallup, for which you can, you can rightly feel proud uh, with that. Were there any, was there any a, ma a major regret or two uh, that you uh, that you have in terms of things that continue to need attention? Um, you know, my uh, I guess one regret that I have is that I I I simply could not financially afford running for a second term. I had, uh, um, as I say, I'm. A lawyer and my law practice suffered greatly during those four years and uh, I had kids heading into college and just couldn't couldn't had expended um, or had used up my uh, financial reserves at that point yeah uh, so it was just a reality that I, I couldn't uh, right. couldn't run again um, well, I certainly don't, so. yeah I don't uh, Ben I don't yeah I really don't have regrets. I, um, if anything, I, I wish I could have done four more years of it. Right, but so certainly have served as a model uh, for uh, for those who followed you in the in the position of mayor. So for that, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, we uh, yeah, we've had some yeah, we've had we've had we've had some good mayors in Gallup, and uh, a lot of good good people have put really hard effort into it. Oh, good. Well, thank you for your all your your time and effort. Do you have any last thoughts or comments before we close out? Um, well, it's been um, Ben. It's just been a real privilege to work with you. Um, you're just. Uh, um, I think this is a real interest, a real interesting opportunity for. Um, you mean know, your your program? What you're doing with your with your broadcasts um, at, at the Friends of History is something that uh, I, I think is something that's good for New Mexico and uh, gives each of us a, a glimpse into the lives of uh, you know our friends around the state. And I, I also want to plug uh, Grant Taylor, um, you know, who has has handled the, the photographs and done such a great job with them. Uh, well, well, thank you. You're too, uh, you're too kind. Uh, we're happy. We're happy to provide a uh, you know a contribution, and and uh, we certainly want to uh, broaden people's understanding of uh, the history of New Mexico and all its uh, facets, uh, both both good and uh, and and bad. It's a, a remarkable state, and uh, it's uh, been a, been a joy to. Uh, off, offer you know information on that to the public. Um, so thank you again. That's for right. our audience, should you have any additional questions, feel free to use the chat window below. If you'd like to uh, purchase Bob's book, A Place of Thin Veil, Life and Death in Gallup, New Mexico, you can do so from Rio Nuevo Publishers at the web page below or through your favorite bookstore and bookshop.org. In closing, a reminder to all to check out the Friends of History webpage, where you can again watch this lecture as well as other First Wave State lectures covering a wide range of historical topics about New Mexico. And do come back to the webpage to learn about our upcoming 2024 and future topics in the First Wednesday lecture series, and more broadly, about the Friends of History uh, itself. You can join our mailing list either via the web page or by mailing us at uh, the uh, email below. And finally, consider making a donation, however small, so that we can continue to provide these informative lectures throughout the year. We thank you for your support. We look forward to seeing you in the months ahead. So goodbye for now. <laughs>